We've already talked we've about exergonic already talked reactions. About exergonic reactions. Just the fact now that we're going to talk about endergonic exergonic reactions. indicates that there's a different kind of chemical reaction. So now we're going to talk about their opposite endergonic reactions. And so in exergonic reactions, energy is released by the chemical reaction to its surroundings. And so our products have less energy than our reactants. Endergonic is the opposite. In endergonic reactions, the products have more energy from the reactants, and the chemical reaction absorbs energy from the surroundings. The way I remember this is that in exergonic reactions, energy exits the reaction. And then in endergonic reactions, energy enters the reaction. So exergonic energy is produced, it leaves at the end, it exits. Endergonic energy is consumed, it enters. So as an example of an endergonic reaction, we're gonna look at photosynthesis. And so hopefully you remember photosynthesis is the reaction in which plants use light to produce energy. And so photosynthesis literally means photo light and synthesis producing. And so in this reaction, just like in our exergonic reactions, we're going to have our reactants on the left side of the energy diagram. And so here our reactants are water that the plant gets from its roots and carbon dioxide that it absorbs from the air through its leaves. Okay, and so we have our reactants here and you'll notice that this is a little bit different, that this energy diagram is different than the ones we've seen so far because our reactants have the smallest amount of energy on the diagram. Every other point on this energy diagram has more energy than the reactants. And that's because in endergonic reactions, energy is going to go into the reactants and the products will have more energy as a result. So it makes sense that the reactants are the lowest. And so in order for this reaction to happen, just like with exergonic reactions, we need the molecules to have enough energy when they collide for their bonds to break. So we have to reach the activation energy, which means we have to go from down here all the way up to here. So the activation energy in endergonic reactions is a lot higher than in exergonic reactions. And so we would never use these reactions to produce electricity or to power vehicles, et cetera. These are used to store energy, not to use energy. After we've added enough energy for the reaction to occur, it's going to proceed forward and we're going to get our products, which in this case are glucose, which is the sugar that plants will obviously produce and that we eat, and oxygen gas, which we breathe. So photosynthesis, pretty useful to us animals. Okay, so in exergonic reactions, we said that the products were produced like after all the bonds are broken and we have all these individual atoms everywhere, we get the products because the products have less energy than the reactants. And so things with less energy are more stable. And so it's more stable for all those random atoms to join together as the products than the reactants in exergonic reactions, that is. But in endergonic reactions, that's not the case. The reactants are more stable than the products. But since we added all that energy to the reaction to begin with, we can reach a new stable point that has more energy than we started. That's useful for living things because when we consume these higher energy product molecules, our cells carry out exergonic reactions that break them down and release the energy for us to use. So if endergonic reactions require energy to be put into the reactants, then that energy has to come from somewhere. So there's a few different places it can come from. And so in the case of photosynthesis, it comes from the light produced by the sun or by lamps that you put over plants. Okay, And so light's one of the types of energies that we saw being produced by the combustion of gasoline in a car engine. So there are other types of energy produced by the car engine, and there are other types of energy, energy that can go into endergonic reactions. So heat can go into endergonic reactions. Um, in my experience, heat and light are the most common ones. Um, I've seen a couple reactions that might be caused by adding mechanical energy. So like hot hands that you have to like move around in your hands. 
Um, or there's one reaction we did earlier in the year um, where we have to mix up a few chemicals and if they sit by themselves, nothing happens. Once we start mixing them, then a reaction occurs. But I'm not sure if that is actually caused by adding mechanical energy. And then as far as I know, there aren't any chemical reactions that are caused by sound energy, but I could be wrong. Okay, so that's it for endergonic reactions. So just remember exergonic reactions, energy exits the reaction, energy, energy is produced, and endergonic reactions, energy enters the reaction, energy is consumed.